Thank you, Kelsey. Last Monday at 4 o'clock in the morning, we took Stevie to the airport with his roommate Kyle, and they are in the Dominican Republic. We've heard from him a couple of times. I want to thank all of you who uh, supported him to go there. It just, uh, it's going to be a great summer for him. He's on top of the world. We talked to him three times this week. He called last night about 7.30, and uh, Mitchell told him that he would let him preach this summer to kind of get familiar with the services and how they do them for a couple of weeks, and then maybe they would even rotate every other week. Well, last night, he'd been there five days, Mitchell came to him. He'd had a death in his church, um, and he'd gone to be with the family, and he said, Stevie, could you preach tomorrow at both services, at both churches? And uh, Stevie said, sure. And he said, oh, by the way, it's Mother's Day here in the Dominican, and could, could you do a Mother's Day sermon? Stevie said, sure. <laughs> and so we were on the phone with him, giving him the, our Reader's Digest distilled version of everything we know about Mother's Day sermons uh, <laughs> last night. So he's preaching this morning, less than a week there. So thank you guys so much, and, and please pray for him. Uh, I think it's going to be a great summer. If you have your Bibles, turn to John 9. We're going to finish up this story that we've been studying two weeks. This is our third Sunday morning. We'll close and conclude the study of this wonderful story about the healing of a man who had been born blind. He'd never seen in his entire life. No hope of ever seeing until one day when he crosses paths with Jesus of Nazareth. And he would see for the very first time in his life in more than one way. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but as always, before we talk about the Son, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to his Father first. Father, we come before you grateful, thankful that you would allow us to come, thankful that you would meet us in this place, thankful that you are mindful of every need that we have. As we open your word this morning, Father, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We're going to look at verses 34 through 41. We've covered the first 33 verses over the last two weeks, and rather than read the entire story, we'll pick up where we left off and finish it out this morning. Verse 34. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? This is the Pharisees talking to the man who had been blind and was now healed. And they threw him out, and that means out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out of the synagogue, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard this, heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Now, in just a moment, we're going to continue our study of this miraculous healing. But before we do that, let's look back to where we've been and review what we've learned. Two weeks ago, we started out in verse 1, and we saw two things there. First, we noted that this man in our story was born blind. This is the only healing in all four of the Gospels in which the sufferer is said to have been afflicted from his birth. That makes this miracle even greater because he had never seen before in his life, and he had absolutely no hope of ever seeing until he met Jesus. And then secondly, we learned something from verse 1 that we won't learn, and that is the name of this blind man. His story has literally inspired millions and millions of people throughout history, and we don't even know his name, but that's okay. We see that there are a lot of no-names in the Bible, a lot of no-name people who share their stories with us. And as I said, that's okay as long as they point to Jesus of Nazareth with their story. And we learned about sharing our story. Next, we looked at verses 2 and 3, and we noted three things. First, we pointed out the pseudo-religious myth about sin and suffering. 
In Judaism, still to this day, there's a belief that wherever there is suffering, there is sin. That if you are suffering or sick, you deserve it. And God is punishing you for your sin. We saw that's not only a myth, it's a lie from the pit of hell. We saw bad things do happen to good people. Bad things happen to God's people. And suffering is a part of this life, and it's also a part of the Christian life. And God does not deal out sickness and suffering as a payback for human sin. And then secondly, we noted the reason this man was born blind. And it was so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, so that God might be glorified through Jesus healing this man's blindness. And then thirdly, we saw the result of his blindness. Only through his blindness did this man find God. The result of his adversity was meeting Jesus Christ and being healed and getting an address in eternity. Next, we looked at verses 4 and 5. We noted the words we and must. Jesus said, we must do the work of God who sent me. He didn't say I must. He said we must. Jesus has allowed us to be in partnership with him in doing the things of God in this world. And that is no small thing. And then he says, we must do the work of my father and do it now because the daylight is not going to last forever. Jesus is saying, someday my father is going to pull the plug on this whole thing. And then the daylight will be over, and then it will be too late. And then in verses 6 through 7a, we saw Jesus' methodology for healing, that it fit the person in the situation. Jesus took his spit and made some mud, and then he put it on this blind man's eyes. And then he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, why did Jesus use the spit and the mud in the pool? Because he was giving this man something to put his faith in, until he could put his faith in Jesus. Jesus gave him three things that were associated with healing back in the first century to put his faith in. Spit was thought to have had curative and healing value. Mud was also used in the healing process as a compress or a poultice that would hold the medicine in place when it dried. And pools of spring water were believed to be magical and healing, spiritual, special. And so Jesus gave this man three things associated with healing to put his faith in until the healing took place and he could put his faith in the real place in the man, Jesus of Nazareth. And then in verse 7b, we saw the result of the man's blindness was obedience. He was healed. He was able to see for the first time in his life. And we noted the order, obedience first, healing second. Obedience first and then healing second. And then finally, two weeks ago in verses 8 through 12, we noted the willful unbelief of the neighbors who were confronted with the evidence. The blind man's friends and neighbors see him walking around with sight for the first time. He's seen things he's never seen in his life. And they said, no, that's not him. It only looks like him. They would have given anything to disprove his healing miracle. Because that's the character of skeptical, unbelieving human nature. When God works in your life, we learn that we make the choice to give him the credit for his actions. To point to him. And then last Sunday morning... We looked at verses 13 through 17, where we noted the Pharisees' suitcase system of theology. You ever pack a suitcase, had more stuff to put in than the suitcase would hold? And so you cram and you push and you sit on the suitcase trying to get everything in, but sometimes it doesn't all fit and something has to be eliminated and rejected. Well, these religious leaders in our story have a suitcase system of theology. They reject anything that doesn't fit neatly into their little suitcase of beliefs. Jesus didn't fit. His miracles didn't fit. This healed blind man certainly didn't fit, and so they simply rejected everything that didn't fit. And then in verses 18 through 23 last week, we took a look at cop-out time down at the old synagogue. This blind man's parents threw him under the bus when it begins to cost them something. They deny knowing anything about his healing or who performed the miracle because they don't want to make the Jews mad and get kicked out of the synagogue. And we learn from that that we've got to stand up and be counted in this world with our witness for Christ, whenever we've got the opportunity to do so. And then in verses 24 through 25, we noted the need for a balance of doctrine and experience. We saw that a man with an argument is no match for a man with experience. All the Pharisees had was an argument. But this blind man had an experience, a miraculous experience with the Son of God. And we noted his words that made it into John Newton's famous hymn, Amazing Grace, I was blind, but now I see. And then finally last Sunday, we noted the practice and the biblical principle of confrontation in love. This former blind man had had, he'd had enough. The religious leaders were bugging him. They were bugging his parents. They were bugging his neighbors. And so he finally got upset and he confronted them. We as Christians have been called to be peacemakers. But confrontation is sometimes, listen, 
sometimes necessary in the body of Christ. Confrontation alone produces anger and hurt feelings and division. But confrontation in love produces education and change and growth. All right, that catches us up from the past two Sundays. And this morning we're going to start with verse 34 and study the rest of this great miracle about the blind man who was healed. Here we go. First of all, verse 34. It says this, To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out, out of the synagogue. Listen, when you can't win the argument, make a distraction. When you can't win the argument, make a distraction so that the focus is off of you and your inability to make your case. The religious leaders have painted themselves into a corner and there's no way out here. There are no holes in this guy's story. He really was blind from birth. He's never had sight a day in his life. Jesus comes along and heals him and now he can see. And the Pharisees can't prove otherwise. The evidence is standing there confronting them. So what do they do? They create a distraction. They start abusing and insulting this former blind man to take the focus off of them and their weakness and the weakness of their argument. First, they heap insults and abuse on him. They say to him, you were steeped in sin before you were ever born. How dare you? How dare you, you nobody? How dare you, you blind beggar? Lecture us, the Pharisees. Do you know who we are? We're the Pharisees. We're the leaders of the high Sanhedrin court. And you lecture us? Then they resort to physical force and they literally throw him out of the synagogue. People who are caught in a lie usually do three things. First of all, they talk louder. Secondly, they talk faster. And eventually, they get angry. And that's what's happening with the Pharisees here. They don't have truth on their side. Truth is opposing them. And so they get loud and insulting and angry. You see, their argument is no longer an argument. It's just a contest in bitterness. When you're wrong and you get caught, you create a distraction. You remember the Wizard of Oz? They make it into the Emerald City, into the throne room of the wizard. There's the fire and the steam and this big floating head, and then Toto pulls the curtain back. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You see, the smoke and mirrors just take the focus off of stupidity. About eight years ago, I had a woman about my age and her 84-year-old mother come to this church and start attending here. They had attended another church here in town all of their lives, a different denomination totally. And after about six months, they both came into my office one day and sat down and they said, we want to be baptized and join the church. And out of curiosity, I said, why do you want to join the church? And the 84-year-old mother, she answered, she was such a sweet woman, she's since gone home to be with the Lord. But she said, because I've learned more about the Bible here in the last six months than I did in 48 years that I was at the other church. So I baptized her and her daughter, and they became members here. The following week, their former pastor, where they had attended for 48 years, found out about them being baptized and joining the church, and he went to their house to pay them a visit. They said he was visibly angry and upset and very loud when he came in. And he asked, why were you baptized? You didn't need to be baptized. You were baptized as babies. Why did you join that church? They said, God led us there, and that's what we wanted to do. And he said, after having lost his argument, don't you know that pastor there is a wolf in sheep's clothing and a false teacher? So when he finally leaves their house, very angry still, I got a call from the daughter telling me about the conversation. So I called this pastor up. I called him in his office. And when he came to the phone, I said, Hi, I'm Bill Lockman. I'm the pastor down at Seymour Christian Church. You know me. I'm the wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm the false teacher. He said, No, I don't believe we've ever met. And I said, If we've never met, why would you call me a false teacher and a wolf in sheep's clothing? There was silence on the other end of the phone as as he was painting around his feet in the corner. I said, have you ever been here to church and heard me teach? He said, no. I said, have you ever heard me speak anyplace else? He said, no. 
I said, have you ever heard a CD or a DVD of my teaching? He said, no. I said, then why would you call me a wolf in sheep's clothing and a false teacher? Now, knowing that he had completely painted himself into the corner, he did what the Pharisees did. He created a distraction. He said, well, you answer me a question. Why are you stealing sheep from another man's flock? I said, I don't steal sheep, but I do plant grass, and they decided to eat here. When you can't win the argument, you create a distraction to take the focus off of you and your weakness. Kids do it all the time. See, I told you I was right and you were wrong. You're always wrong. Oh, yeah, well, you're fat and ugly and stupid. (laughs) Distraction. Jesus says, be careful. Be careful when you're criticizing someone else because those who are most critical and judgmental of a speck in someone else's eye are usually guilty of having a plank in their own eye. Christians, we got to be very careful as we present truth to the world. If we get cornered, we don't fight back. We listen and we respond in love. All right, let's move on. Verse 35a, it says this. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out of the synagogue, and when Jesus found him, Jesus went looking. I love that because that's what Jesus does. He finds the lost and the oppressed and the brokenhearted, and he goes to them. Psalm 27, 9b through 10. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will never forsake me. You see, the Jews cast this man out of the temple, but the Lord of the temple went out and found him. The Jews cast this man out of the temple, but the Lord of the temple went out and found him. If any man's Christian witness separates him from his fellow man, it brings him nearer to Jesus Christ. Jesus is always true to the man who is true to him. St. Francis of Assisi found Jesus Christ, and he devoted himself to serving God at a very young age. And when he did, his father, who was a very, very wealthy man, disowned him. He was ridiculed and criticized by his own father, made fun of, and called a fool by his family and his friends. And when he was disowned by his father and family, St. Francis said this, and I want you to listen. He said, until this time in my life, I have been faithful to serving my father. But now I desire to serve God. That is why I return to my father his money, which has given him so much trouble, and my clothing and all that I've ever received from him. And from this day on, I shall always say, my father who art in heaven. In 1226, at the age of 44, St. Francis died. And very few men in the history of Christendom have ever made the impact that he made. And you know why? Because when he was kicked out, there was another man out there to receive him named Jesus. When he gave, there was someone bigger than him giving back. Some of you are having trouble right now taking a stand for Christ because of social pressure, business pressure, or family pressure. Let me tell you something I've discovered. When Jesus has been more real in my life than at any other time, it's always been when I was rejected by men. If you think it's your goodness that appeals to God, it's not. It's how much you're willing to give up for him. Jesus hung out with the tax collectors and the sinners because they knew their need for him. You know, we're not like a lot of churches here. We're a church of misfit toys. And I think that's why Jesus feels welcome and comfortable here. Mary Magdalene was a sinner, a former prostitute, a nobody. But Jesus loved her. She was ridiculed and persecuted and almost stoned because of her love for Jesus. And she was the first person he revealed himself to as the risen Christ. After the resurrection, she got to spread the news of the empty tomb because that's how Jesus works. All right, let's move on. Verses 35 through 38 says this. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and he went and found him. He said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said what? Lord, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Blindness from birth, that's pretty horrible. Parents afraid to stand with him, that's bad. Persecution being cast out of the synagogue, that's bad too. But also that he might know the king of kings and know that every bit of it was worth it. 
Listen, if you have everything and don't know Jesus, you have nothing. If you have him and have nothing else, you have everything. Let me say it again. If you have everything and don't know Jesus, you have nothing. If you have him and have nothing else, you have everything. I talked to a friend not long ago whose brother-in-law had passed away. His brother-in-law had fame and money and wrote songs for some of music's greatest artists. His funeral attenders and well-wishers included some of Hollywood and Nashville's biggest stars. But tears welled up in my friend's eyes when he told me, I don't know if he knew Jesus. I don't know if he knew Jesus. And folks, if he didn't know Jesus, he had nothing. Jesus is a gentleman, and he doesn't strong-arm his way into anybody's life. You've got to come. It's a process. He meets you where you are, and you can watch him work, even the miraculous. But then you've got to make a decision. All right, let's move on. Verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. (laughs) You know what's happening here? Jesus was saying, settle down. Let judgment be mine. Vengeance is mine. Settle down. The reason he said this was because this man, because Jesus knew what this guy was thinking. This blind man that he healed was thinking, Jesus, man, I didn't know who you were at first. But now I do know. You're the son of God. You're the Messiah. Let's go get those suckers. Let's go get the Pharisees. We'll teach them to throw me out of the synagogue. Come on, Jesus. We're back and throw a lightning bolt at them. And Jesus says, be be careful. You leave judgment to me. I went on a mission trip one time with a dear pastor friend of mine. We had a mountaintop experience preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in Haiti. We said our goodbyes. We parted ways in the Miami airport. He flew to his hometown. I flew back to Tampa. He called me the very next day. He said, Bill, you'll never guess what happened. I said, what happened? He said, last night when I got to the airport, I was looking for my wife. She was supposed to pick me up, but she wasn't there. And then I saw one of my elders standing there, and he told me that he told my wife he would pick me up at the airport and bring me home. And then my friend said, and Bill, he fired me on the ride home. He told me the church no longer needed me. You talk about from the mountaintop to the valley. I was so mad I couldn't speak. I said, that is so wrong. That's so wrong on so many levels. I said, I'll come up. We'll confront him. My friend said, no. I said, why not? He said, because that's God's business, not mine. And he was right. Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Dr. James Mallory, an Atlanta psychiatrist, talks about the halls of injustice that we create, that we all have. And this is what he writes, and I want you to listen. This is so good, and it's so true. This is what he says. We keep a museum in the back blackness of our hearts, and there we construct statues reminding us of the people who have done us in. And when we're really having a pity party, we go into that museum and close the door and shine up the statues of injustice. You don't have to do that, ladies and gentlemen. God will do that for you. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Let him do that. He'll do a whole lot better job than you can do. You see, the judgment of our lives is the cross of Calvary. You can accept it and escape his wrath, or you can reject it and embrace his wrath. All right, this is the last one. Verses 40 through 41, and we will have covered all 41 verses of this wonderful story. Here we go. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and ask, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. See what Jesus is saying here to the Pharisees? He's saying, you guys are the religious folks. You're the teachers of the law. You're the teachers of the scriptures to these people. And because you're supposed to see clearly but can't see me, you will be held responsible and your guilt remains. Thomas Akempis said this, The more thou knowest and the better thou understandest, more strictly shalt thou be judged. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I beat my body, I make it my slave, 
so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. James 3, 1, listen. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Let me give you a very uncomfortable principle. Every time you hear the truth and understand it, you are responsible for it. I'll say it again. Every time you hear the truth and understand it, you are responsible for it because you can no longer claim ignorance. I'm glad that our Father is a forgiving God. I'm glad that the blood of Christ was shed for me so that when I fail my responsibility and I blow it big time, I will still be forgiven and make it home before the dark. I want you to note the full process of salvation in this blind man's life. In verse 11, beginning of the story, he calls Jesus a man. In verse 17, he calls him a prophet. In verse 28, he says that he is a disciple of Jesus, meaning that Jesus is someone worth following. And then in verse 38, he calls Jesus Lord and worships him. That needs to take place in everybody's life. Let me finish with this. When I was 10 years old, and that was back in 1963, my dad took me on a fishing trip to Real Foot Lake in western Tennessee. And there was an incident that happened on that trip that I will never forget as long as I live. One evening after we got cleaned up, we went into town to get something to eat. And we stopped at a restaurant. And that restaurant is, is still there today. I Googled it yesterday afternoon, showed a picture of it. But we stopped at a restaurant. We parked in the parking lot in the back. And when we walked towards the front of the restaurant, I noticed a door at the back of the building. And above the door, there was a sign. And the sign read, Colored's Entrance. Colored's Entrance. We kept walking towards the front door, and there there was a drinking fountain with two spigots. And one was labeled white, and the other was labeled colors. When we got inside the restaurant, I had to go to the bathroom, and there was a sign on the door of the bathroom that said, Whites Only. I had never seen racism and discrimination like that before. It bothered me greatly as a 10-year-old child, and it bothers me greatly to even repeat that story as an adult today. As I've said before, whoever said ignorance is bliss was just ignorant. Jesus is telling the religious leaders, once you guys have truth, you can no longer claim ignorance. You're responsible for that truth. Well, there you have it. Three weeks on two kinds of blindness. One was bad enough. It was from birth. But Jesus dealt with that as the great physician, and he healed him. And then he gave him another kind of sight, the sight of truth. But Jesus said that there were other blind people there, and their blindness was even greater than physical blindness. It was blindness to the one who could have given them real sight. Somebody tells about two blind men, both were beggars alongside the road, each had a sign. And on one beggar's sign, it said, I'm blind. And on the other beggar's sign, it said, I'm blind, and it's spring. Think about that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for giving us sight in the middle of the darkness. I thank you for not giving up on us ever. And not only is is it just a one-time decision to come to you, but it's just a, a, a basket of grace that we fall into every day that we walk with you. You never turn your back. You're always there to love us and to catch us and encourage us and send us on our way. We look back at you, and behind you we see that cross on Calvary and Jesus there. And knowing that it's not just a myth, that it's real, that a price was literally paid, an awesome, horrible price. 
And no matter what we do, we can go free. No matter how bad we mess it up, you're always going to love us. No matter how blind we are, you're always going to open our eyes. We thank you, Father, for being there in the midst of our darkness, and we thank you for giving us the everlasting light. In his name, Christ Jesus, we pray.